So let's just look at maybe this last page. So here I, on number four, I tried to get your attention because you need to read really carefully. I didn't specify the time interval, I specified how many intervals. Okay, so I specified use six intervals of equal time length. For, that was for you to figure out, okay? So if it's 30 seconds and six equal time intervals, the length of each time interval is? Five. So you're going to do five seconds now, and you're going to use the right side. So from zero to five. Boom. Then five to ten. We're going to use the right side, so the, the speed at ten. And then fifteen. This didn't turn out so good. This should be like this. Okay, and then 20. Wow, I'm not doing a good job here. That's where I want to stop, right there. This should have started here. Here. Anyway. And then 30. So something like this. Okay, and so, first of all, will our, will our distance traveled, our estimate based on this pretend rate function be overestimate or underestimate? Under. under. So why will it be underestimate? And it's not, so it's, it's not because our graph is underneath that graph, okay? That, that's not a great response. Why, is, why will our distance travel be an underestimate based on our pretend graph? Yes, sir? Uh, talk to me about speed and time and distance. Are you going to say something? Um, the, the speed that you uh, record for the average is uh, lower than it is for the rest of the average. Okay. All right. And so then what about our distance then? It would be overall less distance traveled. Time. Right, because yeah, so this, so our our estimated distances are our speed is all lower than the actual speed, right? And so if you go at a lower speed, you go less of a distance. So our estimated distance would be less. Okay, and in this one, you used uh, here you use five intervals, and here we use six intervals. So which is going to give us a, a better result? Okay, and what's the reason it gives us a better result? So, good reason. Yes, sir. There are, there are six intervals in here. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, when we have six, we're going to have a better estimate. Why is it a better estimate with more intervals? Yes, sir. You're closer to the actual graph. To where say if you're doing if you have like a hundred intervals, it'd be even closer, closer to what that. Right, a pretend function. What? Go ahead. Uh, you reduce the average by increasing the number of intervals. Um. Okay, but so but the reason that we get a better estimate is more to what he was saying, and that is. The, the smaller your intervals, the better our pretend function does at mimicking the actual function. So that, that's the whole goal here is we're trying to come up with a function that pretends to be the actual changing speed function. And the more intervals that you use, the better that will be. And so if we use lots and lots of intervals, it, it'll end up looking like this. The graph will end up looking like this. So those are all constant rates, right? But if you kind of squint your eyes or you look for a distance, it looks like the rate, but those are all little teeny constant rates. So that was, something like that would be even better. So the more intervals you do, the better, the better your pretend graph matches the actual graph, and so then you get a better estimate. Okay. So then the, which of the four estimates will give the best, and we just talked about that, it'll be number four. The, mo the more intervals, the better the estimate. Okay, so now we want to write an expression using S of T that represents the actual distance traveled by the meter. 
So if we want to write an expression that gives the actual distance traveled by the meteor using our S of t. Is S of t a quantity or a rate of change? Rate of change. change. So what would the expression be? Four, three, two. Four, three, two. Minus, is it seven point five? Yes, sir. Uh, and we want to put parentheses there. Yeah, and you could also write S of T there. That's because that's the same thing. So what you could have S of T, or you could actually write the actual rule there. So how does this expression relate to all this, all the previous? So that was kind of I did this kind of like a little bit of a jump here. How does this expression relate to everything you did earlier in this worksheet? So how does this, maybe let's take a moment and talk to the person next to you. How does, so this is, we did all this, you know, we made these step functions, right? We made these uh, pretend functions, and then we came up with an estimate for the distance. And here's the actual distance. So where, what's the, what bridges the gap between everything you did previous in this worksheet and this right here? So maybe talk about that, okay? Get a partner. So. So what does this have to do with the stuff before? Okay, so this is how you found the approximate distance, right? You got the distance in the first interval by doing the, sp the constant speed times the amount of time. And then the distance in the second interval by the speed times the amount of time, etc. And then you added all those up, right? So how does that then, what, so this is finding distance, but then this is finding distance. So what is the... What's the link from, or what's, how do we bridge, make sense of this relative to this? Somebody here, yeah. Adam. So it's essentially doing the same thing that we did okay. as far as making those intervals, except for it makes the intervals extremely small. Okay. So it mimics the actual rate graph. Well, in that case, exactly. Okay. So this right here is expressing the same thing as this up here, but the, the difference is, he said it, what's the difference? Really, really, really super, super small intervals, and that's what we mean by say dt instead of instead of delta x up here, which could mean like not small intervals, and that's what we have right five seconds. Those are very large intervals. Okay, dt means really, really small, like a nanosecond, or or uh, yeah, nanosecond. That's that's pretty small. So yeah, so so this means the same thing because this here is how could we rewrite this as the sum of each rate times the delta x. And what does this mean? It means the same thing. What's that? Integral sign means sum of what? k delta x. And here is, this is equivalent to k. It's the whole speed function. Okay? And this is like our delta x. So when you see an integral, you're, th you're thinking this right here. When you see an integral, you're thinking, oh, we're going to add up a bunch of, and this is going to, we're going to do this all semester, okay? We're going to add up a bunch of little bits of a quantity. As that rate changes, we're going to be thinking about the first one plus the second one. It's just to get it exact, we need a zillion of those little bits at a really, really small interval. So integral means exactly what you were doing in those previous things, just a lot more, right? Okay, and then but we have the fundamental theorem to do that for us. 
instead of having to go back and, you know, find a million of these or a billion of these and add them together, right? That would take us our whole life. So instead, we can say that the total change in distance Well, if we just had the distance function, then this would be easy, right? We just find the, the final distance minus the initial distance traveled. So how can we, if, how, how does this relate to our distance function? What is that thing relative to our distance function? Derivative. He says derivative, agree with that? That's the rate of change of, that's speed, that's rate of change of distance. So he's saying that that is the derivative of the distance function. And therefore, if we want the distance function, we're going to take the antiderivative, which is 432t minus 7.5 times 1 half t squared. And then we're going to evaluate that at 30, the final value of distance, minus the initial value of distance. And then whatever number you got, it should have been close, to the, the closest of the four estimates should have been number four. If you went back and checked. Is this like 9,000 or something? 95, 85? Someone else get that? Does that sound familiar? And so then of the estimates, number four should have been the closest to that number. Okay, any questions on the meteor? So the, our spending two days on this was so that when you look at an integral, you, there's, a whole, there's this whole world of meaning behind it, right? And you should... Be thinking, oh, I'm summing up a bunch of little bits of the quantity calculated by this changing rate, right? right? Every time I get a new bit, I have a new rate that I'm using. I'm going to sum up all those bits of the quantity to get the total change of the total amount of the quantity. So that's what you're thinking about whenever we're working with an integral. Any questions? Okay, so uh, let's... Hold off on, we'll do a couple examples of the antiderivatives and then we'll see if there's one that we can uh, do from the homework. So let's go to So I gave you, I did one example of this and then you kind of, this, uh, the homework kind of introduced you kind of the idea of this. So what we're going to call, it's, it's going to call undoing the chain rule, okay, undoing the chain rule. And so recall the chain rule says that if you have a composite function, meaning one function plug into another, what would the derivative be? So if it's g of f of x, then how would you state what the derivative is? G prime of x times f prime of x. Is that what you're saying? Yep. That was g prime of f of x times f prime of x. Okay, that's our derivative. So now we're doing antiderivative, right? If we're, we're, we want to use the fundamental theorem to find the total change in a quantity, we're going to need antiderivatives. So we're going to be on the lookout for rate functions that look like this, g prime f of x times f prime of x. And what do we want? We want the original quantity function, so that's going to be like g of f of x. Okay. So the question is, what will you focus on? So you're given this, this result of the chain rule. What will you focus on in order to recover the quantity function? So we'll just call it the we'll call it quantity instead of accumulation, we'll call it quantity, it's fine. What will you focus on? The g prime f of x or the f prime of x? F g prime. What, yeah, so which one is almost exactly the same as what we want? Right? You're going to look at that. And then going backwards, the F prime just gets absorbed, right? It's just gone because so, so, cause we're just going to end up with G of F of X. So what will the approach be? So we're going to write the antiderivative of the exterior function, keeping the interior function F as it is. That's the basic principle. Then there's a little mess we have to clean up sometimes, right? There may be a, a factor that we have to figure out what this extra little factor is. 
But th this is the main thing. We're going to uh, figure out which what we're looking at, which part of it is the g prime f, and then we're going to just do the antiderivative of g. And we're pretty much 90% there. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so that's just a summary of the previous, a previous summary. Okay, so here's an example. So when you look at this, you say, oh, is this the result? Does it look like the result of a chain rule uh, derivative? So you want to think like this. This is like g prime f times f prime, the result of the chain rule, and, and we need to recover the original g of f of x. So which part is g prime f? Is it this first thing x cubed, or is it 8 minus x to the fourth to the fifth? A or B? Yeah, definitely. We're looking for the composite, right? So we're looking for the composite function. And then just, just to check, just to do a little check, we could say, oh, so let's see. Is this x cubed of the form of the derivative of what's inside? It needs to be, right? So does is x cubed... Uh, a multiple, a constant multiple of the derivative of what's inside. Yes or no? Does it work? What is the derivative of what's inside? Negative 4x cubed, right? And so that has, that's just a negative 4 away from that. So that's like a little quick check you can do just to start. So that, that other thing, which is going to be f prime, is, is like a multiple of the derivative of what's inside our composite. Okay, so what we're going to do is, we're going to take a shot at this. So we you told me that this is our g prime f of x. And we're trying to recover g of f of x. So we just need to figure out what is the function g prime here and what's its antiderivative. So what is the g prime part of this and what's its antiderivative g? So when you're thinking about G prime, what, what is representing G prime here? The whole thing, right? The, the kind of the, the structure, the whole overall structure of it, which is what function? It's the overall structure of it, the outside function. So to the fifth, something to the fifth, right? So G prime is something to the fifth, and we need to recover G. So what would it be? Something to the sixth. Something to the sixth. Actually, uh, one sixth. That thing to the sixth. So this is going to be our first attempt, right? We know this is at least close. If it's not perfect, it's close. And so now, how can we check it? The derivative. So we're going to check. So the derivative is. So we'll do six times. 1 sixth, 8 minus x to the fourth, to the sixth, times what? Negative 4x cubed. Don't forget the negative, right? Because it's minus x to the fourth. And then we compare it to what we started with. Is it the same or different? Different. different. And how is it different? By what factor? There's a, negative four. There's a negative 4 that we don't want, right? There's a negative 4 in our derivative here that's not what we had. So then we say, how would we need to adjust this attempt so that when we took the derivative, that negative 4 wouldn't be there? Uh, negative 1 one fourth. Okay, second attempt would be negative 1 fourth times 1 sixth times 8 minus 6 to the fourth. That's so there's our second attempt. And then we check it. And so this is really what? Negative 1 over 24 times 8 minus 6 to the 4 to the 6th. And if we check it, we get 6 times negative 1 24th, which is negative 1 4th, 8 minus 6 to the 4th to the 5th times negative 4x cubed. And what happens? Negative 4, negative 1 4th goes away. Do we have exactly what we started with? Yes. Therefore, now given a rate function, given a rate function, 
How many quantity functions are there that have that as its rate of change? Is there just one? There's lots because our quantity could start at any value and then proceed at that rate. So, we, so what we have to do is we have to say we want all such quantity functions, meaning we have to add a constant c. We want all such quantity functions that have that as its rate of change, which is an infinite number, right? So that's what you, if it's an indefinite integral, if there are no limits here, then what we're saying now is we want a quantity function, in fact, we want every quantity function that has that thing as its rate of change. So that's every vertical shift of the same quantity graph that has that rate of change. So that's why we add C. Okay, questions on this, what we're doing here? So uh, I'm just going to give you lots of examples, okay? And we're just you guys can just work them, and you can check with each other, and then uh, we'll do some. Or so maybe is there was there one from the homework that was a little that we want to talk about? Negative x to the negative e. Okay. Yeah, that's. Um, yeah, sure, we can do that. Any questions on this example? Does it do you follow what we're doing? Okay. So what'd you say? Okay, so we don't have two things multiplied together. All right, we only have one thing. So if you just have one thing, then that is going to be your g prime of f. Unless it's just a straightforward undoing a rule that you know, right? But if there's, if there's just one thing, then you can just treat it as this. And we say, okay, what's the big picture of this? In, in other words, what's the structure? What's our g prime? Is it an uh, exponential function? Is it... Um, is it a monomial raised to a power? Is it, what is it? Yeah, it's, this is x to the e, or x to the minus e, right? So it's x to the minus e. So how would we take the antiderivative of x to the something? Be x to the? Yeah, so it'd be, we'd raise the power, but then we'd also need yeah, we, we need to divide by that same thing. So here's an attempt. And remember, so the, the beauty of this is you don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just get something, get something that's, get a start, and then check it. And if it's not right, then you can adjust it. So don't feel like, I think students, they, they freeze, and they feel like they got to get it that first attempt right. No, the beauty is we can take the derivative and check, and then use our check to help us refine it and make it right. Okay, so um, derivative will be what? We'll take negative e plus 1 times that, which will give us 1 times x to the, well, this minus 1. All right, now what? Times Times nothing? Yeah, that's it. There's yeah, there's no interior function, right? This is just a number. So that's it. That's our check. Because if it was it was e to the you know e to the fourth, we would do four e to the cube, and there would be this is just a number. There's no interior function to do the chain rule here. That's just a, you gotta see that it's just a number. So our check is just that. So how do we do on our first attempt? Do we have to adjust, or do we get it? There's just a negative sign on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the attempt, the first attempt, the x. That's minus x. So I just, I just left it off. Okay. So yeah. If, so you could. It, it doesn't matter, right? So should there be a negative sign on the first attempt? Yes or no, right? It's the first attempt. You see. So if you thought to put a negative sign there. 
then your check would have been negative x to the minus e, and you would have been done. But I didn't put the negative sign, so I have to adjust. So, so what is my second attempt? Negative 1 over negative e plus 1, x to the minus e plus 1. So if that was your first attempt, bravo, you got it on the first try. I didn't, right? So I left off the negative. And then we need plus c. Now, if you want to be a little, you want to tidy it up here, let's take off two negatives here. This would really be the same as, what, 1 over e minus 1, x to the negative e plus 1. So that's a little bit cleaner. Same thing. Questions on that one? Anything else from these? How about uh, explanation? So, any other requests before we get, do some other examples? Yeah. Negative x to the negative one. Negative x to the negative one. Okay, so uh, that's really that's really not um, using the chain rule because if we did negative x to the negative 1. So when you just when you have a negative sign, like on this one, we could have just brought it out and did it without it. So let's do that here. So that's the same as the opposite of 1 over x dx. Would you agree? Or x to the minus 1? So now we're asking, what's the antiderivative of this? Or what function gives us 1 over x as a derivative? Natural, natural log. Natural log. So that was supposed to be minus natural log. And then we should really have absolute value there. Because the domain of natural log is only from 0 to infinity, but this domain is for all real numbers. So we allow so this allows us to put all real numbers in for x. Because our rate of change is for all real numbers. So we need a, we need a quantity function that's for all real numbers too. Does that clear it up? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's do some more examples, or I'll give you some more to work on here. <coughs> let's see here. Okay, so oftentimes you'll see these hidden as fractions. Here's one. So we're used to the result of chain rule. We're used to it being a product. But here's a quote, here's a fraction, right? It's a quotient. So if we're gonna if we're gonna if we suspect this is undoing the chain rule, then we've got to see this as a product. So we want to rewrite it. How can we rewrite this as a product? What would it be? What times what is equal to sine radical x over radical x? Okay, so sine radical x times this would be, if it's x to the 1 half in the denominator, it's the same as x to the negative 1 half. Okay, want to try? So you, you guys try. So you ch you first you isolate which of those two terms is g prime f, and then you're going to take your first attempt, which is going to be the antiderivative of g prime. Check it and adjust, and then you can check with each other. Think here, how do we do? So which is g prime f? Number one or number two? Number one. Number one, okay. Therefore, what will our first attempt be? If we're looking at this, then we're looking for what is g prime, or what's the overall structure, and that's what we're going to look at for the antiderivative. So somebody new. What do you think? Sir? Um, Did you do negative 2 on your first attempt? Uh, no. So let's do the first attempt. What was your first attempt? Uh, negative cosine. Negative cosine? Of? Root x. Root x. 
That should have been your first attempt. Or, I mean, if, if you can do it all at once, if you can, you know, get it on the first attempt, that's great. And after a lot of practice, you know, you may be able to see it. But we'll go with this. And then, so the derivative of that is? Um, it's uh, sine root x. Right. Uh, um, times uh, x to the negative half. Okay. Is that it? Is that right? Um, there's a half. Yeah, one half, right? One half. How we do? Is that the right derivative? No, is that the right derivative? Is the derivative right? No. Yeah. Is the derivative right? Our check. Is the check correct? Yes. All right. So now we compare it to what we started with. Are they the same? Not the same. What do we need? We need to get rid of this. We need that one half to not be there if we were to do this step. So then, how would we make our second attempt? Negative. Two. Two. And that'll do it. Okay, any questions? So you just need to practice, okay? Practice. And this will be for your sheet. Any of these that you want to put in your notes to take with you? I welcome you can you're welcome to do that, but you're gonna put these on your sheet to turn in. So I'll just gonna I'm just gonna list them here down the side what you're gonna Okay, so number three. Ready? So for number three, we're gonna have to start by writing this as two to the t times what? Two to the t plus three to the negative one power. So which is our g prime of f? First here or second? Second. This is our g prime of f, okay? f of t. So then what characterizes this derivative of g function, this g prime function? What characterizes that? What is g prime? What kind of function? Sine, square root, Exponential. No, g prime. I'm asking just what we're I'm just identifying. What is g prime? Is it, uh, to the negative one. To the negative one, right? The overall structure of that part is something to the negative one. So that's our g prime. So our g prime is something to the negative one. So what? So you may think, okay, that's power rule. Add one and do all that stuff, right? What happens when you add one? You get to the zero power, and then you have one over zero times that to the zero power. That's a mess, right? So that's your that's your warning signs. Something's not right here. Power rule isn't working because you first of all you can't divide by zero, and if you have something to the zero, then it all goes away. It becomes one. So that's your warning sign. Okay, here's the one case where you don't use the power rule. You have to recognize that what is what is the function that you take the derivative of it and you get to the negative one. Natural log. So this is the one case that's not the power rule. So what's our first attempt? Natural log, natural log, natural log of. Do you see it? That's this comes up a lot, right? A lot of these problems have just some denominator. So that denominator is two to the negative one, and that's when you're going to have a natural log in, as your as your antiderivative. Okay. Do you follow that much? I think that getting out the starting block is the hard one on this. Okay, so now we're going to do our check. What's the derivative of this? Well, it's going to be 1 over 2 to the t plus 3 times the rate of change or the derivative of the inside. What's the derivative of 2 to the t? No, it's 2 to the t natural log 2. And then derivative of 3 plus 3, which is 0. So there's our derivative. Is it the same as what we started with in terms of the integrand? What's different about it? Uh, we don't, yeah. So in here we have an ln of 2 that we don't want. So how can we adjust the first attempt? 
1 over ln2 times that thing, ln of 2t plus 3. Okay, did you catch it? So if you if you do the power rule and you get you do you're undoing the power rule and you get one over zero times something to the zero, you've got here's lots of warning, right? That something's not right. Raised to the zero, this all goes away. One over zero is undefined. So it's like the red lights are flashing, you're not doing something right. Hold on, it looks like power rule, but it's not. So this that's your warning that. No, this is that one, one case where you don't do the power rule and it's antiderivative as natural law because that derivative is to the negative one. Questions on number three? Okay, how about... Uh, let's look at number six. So number six, you may try that same approach. Okay, you might, can any, last chance, number three, questions, you good? Okay, so number six, you may try the same thing. And you may say, okay, uh, sine x plus secant x to the negative one, or no, sorry, times cosine x to the negative one. But there's a problem here. So you may think, okay, this is my, my g prime of f of x, right? But is this the derivative of that inside? Right? Because so that, this would have to be f prime, and this is f. Is that a close match to the derivative of cosine x? Nothing even, it's not even close, right? Not even close. So something's wrong here. This is not the way to start. So instead, on this one, we want to change the form first. How can we change the form of this? Sine x over cosine. Okay, sine x over cosine x. Plus secant x. Yeah, we can start this way, and then we can handle these as. So, so that would be the first step. And then handle these as two separate integrals. Do two separate problems. Okay, sine x over cosine x. Sine. Okay, yes it is tangent, but what function has its derivative tangent x? What function, if you took the derivative of it, of it is tangent x? No, you're back, that's backwards. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. Now we want the, a function whose derivative is tangent x. Okay, it doesn't exist. Or, I mean, it does, but we don't have a, a quick rule for it, like in the reference guy. So how can we handle this first one? Negative natural log of cosine. Yeah, so sine x times. So now we do this thing. Now, is sine x the derivative of cosine or something close? Yes. That's good. That looks good, right? This is like our f prime, and that's like our f. And that, that works. So that's doable, we can do that. And that's gonna be natural log again, right? That's gonna be natural log. And then the second one, now we've got secant x over cosine x. Can we change that to secant squared x? Secant squared, is that the same as secant squared x? Because uh, true identity is one over cosine x. Right. Now we need to do the antiderivative of secant squared. That's tangent, right? The derivative of tangent is secant squared. So we can split this into two. And we can do undoing the chain rule on the first. And then the second one is we don't have to, we just have to know our rule that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Did you follow all that? So what's this going to mean? Natural log of cosine x? It would be a first attempt. And then you're going to find that you're going to need a negative sign. Once you take the derivative of that, you're going to get a negative that you don't want. So you're going to take a negative of that. Right, and then plus? 
just tan x. So how do we get that sequence correct? So uh, the definition of 1 over cosine, see, secant is 1 over cosine. So, so this, this is the same as secant x times 1 over cosine, which is another secant. So this is secant squared. Yeah. This, that, that's what secant is. Secant is 1 over cosine. And so secant squared, its antiderivative is tangent. Okay, please, so if I lost you, please ask. Please ask, because I, I did most of the talking there. So this is another technique that you run into. When you have a fraction like this with a single term in the denominator, sometimes it helps, and you'll see this in your homework, sometimes, to break it up into separate integrals with a common denominator, right? That common denominator of cosine x. So let's do, uh, no, I'm so close. So, um, I'll just make one more round for questions, and we'll, in about five minutes, four or five minutes, we'll push on. We'll continue on, okay? Sure. So how can we write an expression? We want to write an expression that if we calculated that, that expression, it would give us what we need. So we start with 400, and we've got the rate of change. We want to know how much will there be after three hours. So could you write an expression that is equal to the answer? To this question. Anybody? Somebody here? Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's the integral from 0 to 3 of uh, 450 over 268 to e power 1.2570. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Will that equal the answer? Uh, then we added the property. Add, you want to do what? Add the property. Add what? The initial population. Okay, which is? Am I going to add the 400 inside here or outside of this? No, outside. outside. So let's put it in front, how about? So there's no mistake. So we start with 400. And then we figure out this change in the population from 0 to 3 if the rate of change is RT. What do you guys think? Agree or disagree? Uh, I was just wondering, is the formula the arbitrary constant that you get at the end of the uh, No. Okay, so that it's, it's uh, it is not. If you, were, if you were just doing all such functions without the 0 to 3, it would, no, uh, it would be that would be different because in this case, when you plug, uh, it's kind of a complicated question, but no, it's not. If you want, we can talk more about it like after class. I don't want to get into it. It's kind of a can of worms. But um, so, does this make sense? Is this right? Yeah, question. I was, I was thinking, is four hundred not like the, the equivalent of at zero because you told us when when it was starting? Right. So are you? What are you saying then? You want to make this four hundred? No, I was supposing like after like doing the antiderivative, find the constant to use like the four hundred. Yeah. So so you're saying make a quantity function and then plug in three. You that's what you're saying. You use the four hundred to make an actual quantity function. Yeah. And then plug three into that quantity function to get the answer. Uh, plug in zero to find the constant to for t to find the initial constant. 
What is yeah, but that, that you're no. That's finding the function. That's finding the quantity function. Yeah. Right. And then after you're done with all that, you're going to plug in three to answer this question. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another way to do it. But uh, according to what we, yes, according to what we've done in the first couple of days, though, we can talk about the change in population in the first three days. This is how much the population changes from zero to three, and then we're going to add on the initial. So uh, we need to. This should be. Another practice problem here. Can you find that antiderivative? So can you do this? What are we going to focus on here? What is our g prime of f? What is our quote unquote g prime of f? That's right. Do you see that as one function plugged into another? Do you see that as a composite function? What is the g prime there? E, the e function, exponential function, e to the something. That's our g prime. So therefore, what is g? What's our first attempt? It's going to be whatever. What is the function that whose derivative is e to the something? E to the something, right? That's the one where the, the, the rate of change is the same as. So our first attempt. will be e to the, it will just be that. Say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you don't want to use 1 over t. It's not, it's not 1 over t. Our first attempt is just the antiderivative of e to the something, which is e to the something. Now we're going to take the derivative of that. Um, so it's not 1 over t. You got the right idea. But it's not 1 over t. What is it going to be? 1 over what? So let's, let's, let's do it, and we'll find out. So you kind of got the right idea there. So the derivative will be? So it will be e to that thing, 1.257t, times 1.257. So second attempt will be? So this, so this is what? We don't have, right? So we're just going to, for the, for the 450, 268, we're just going to keep that, to have that as a constant. So we're just going to forget about it and hold on to it, okay? We're just working on what's in the red box here. So we're going to do 1 over this, not 1, do you see that? It's 1 over this, not 1 over t. So the second attempt will be 1 over 1.257 e to the 1.257t. Now, that's going to be from, what, 0 to 3, and that's going to be times 450.268, don't forget that. And then that whole thing is going to be plus 400. So here's, this is the undoing the chain rule part. We got that function as our antiderivative. That 450.268 just came along for the ride. We're going to evaluate that from 0 to 3, and then add the 400 to start. And whatever that turns out to be, that will be the answer. Any questions on that? Last chance. Questions, please. Yes. Uh, so I was going to go first. So you do the um, like the f of three minus f of zero, uh, like first, and then add four hundred to the total there. Uh, we're going to multiply by the four fifty. Uh, no, no, the four hundred at the end. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're going to plug three into this, mm -hmm. and you're going to plug zero into this, and you're going to subtract. Right. When you're all done with that, and you're going to that's going to be the, the the increase from zero to three. Hours, okay, right? That's our that's our uh, amount of increase, our amount of change. But then there was four hundred to start with. Okay. So we had the four hundred. 
Other questions? How about the anti was the antiderivative okay? Everyone got that one? Okay, cool. So the homework tonight is web work. It's all problems like this, but they're all online. Okay? So let me just I'll just show it to you. I'll show you where to go. So if you just go to webwork.asu.edu, you come to a screen like this. And you're going to look for me in MAT 266, right there, Ashbrook. And then you're going to log in with your ASU Red ID. And all you will see is this right here, section 5.5. .5. That's going to open in four minutes, okay, at 6 p.m. So all you, all you should see when you get to this page is section 5.5. .5. You're going to click on that, okay? And then you just go, you can click on the problem. And there you go, that's the first one. So, but uh, you guys will have, 